much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, tonight, our focus of our theme is on the dream of a perfect community. And um, that word perfect is a tough one because we live in a world that is far from perfect <laughs> like that. Uh, apparently, the stand doesn't go up. And I was told just a few minutes ago that we don't think the remote's going to work tonight. So I don't know exactly what will happen uh, with the screens. But I can tell you this. Uh, the team that is right behind me, uh, back behind this platform and in the truck over there and all of the different teams that are doing all of the things here all week long uh, are absolutely amazing. And they're so committed and passionate and uh, they pour their best into this and so highly organized. It's just an amazing crew that they could basically turn this place into a Christian camp for a week uh, like this is absolutely amazing. So I'm going to praise God for them with some applause. And I don't know if that's a Danish thing to do or not, but would you join me? And so just thank you to all of the staff and volunteers. So tonight we talk about the dream of a perfect community. Perfect is hard to find. In an imperfect world, it, impossible to find that train doesn't arrive uh, this side of heaven. And yet, at the same time, it is something to strive for and it is something to move toward. We certainly don't want to just sit back and become spiritually complacent or apathetic and get to the point where we just say, oh, well, you know, this is, I guess, is about as good as it can get uh, in terms of my faith and my journey with Jesus through life. And I don't really want to grow. I don't really want to learn anything new. Uh, after all, uh, you know, I was baptized and confirmed, and what else is there to know, right? Well, there's a lot more to know, and there's a lot more that we can grow into uh, along the way. So let's talk about that tonight. Psalm 133, the first verse, says this, and this is an English translation of the original Hebrew, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant that is when God's people live together in unity. Yeah, that's not going to work, uh, I don't think, tonight. So that's the cue, Jonas, to go to the next screen. And that's not going to work. Uh, so it, can we go to the next screen? I'll, I guess we can or can't. Let me try one more thing. Oh, look. If you let your heart go where it wants to go, you would dream who you are and where you are right now. You would dream this. You would dream this fellowship, this community, this opportunity to connect to other Christians. In a country where Christianity is not fully embraced, to say the least, 
where you are the minority and then some. A very, very small minority from what I'm learning in my really rich and wonderful conversations with a lot of you in between these different talks. And what it's like to be a Christian in a country where maybe one to two percent of the country is actively engaged in the Christian faith on a regular basis. You are here and you are experiencing this in the midst of a crowd of witnesses, as the scriptures say. You're, you're experiencing Christianity at least for a week of this year in a way that is set apart for you by God. That's what holy means. It means set apart for you by God. And I am absolutely inspired. I have to tell you, as, as an American of Scandinavian descent, which is why I, in addition to telling my wife telling me that I look like everybody here, I said, you mean really good looking, right? Uh, so in addition to being good looking, uh, which Scandinavians are, I'm going to say, uh, in addition to that, we have this uh, wonderful thing here that Americans just don't have. Americans are, uh, and I'm not saying Danish people don't do this too, or that you aren't tempted to do it, but this huga that you have, I wasn't kidding at the beginning uh, during that interview. What you have here is not just sort of a cultural thing. What you have here is a spiritual blessing. What you have here is I walked through the camp today <laughs> because it wasn't pouring rain all day, right? You know, that's, turn to the person next to you, please, and say to that person, so this is how it feels to have dry feet. Just go ahead and say that uh, to the people around you. <laughs> so in America, we live a life without margins, and by that I mean when you write uh, something down on a piece of paper, usually you have a margin on the top and you have a margin on the bottom and you have margins on the left and the right because it just makes the whole presentation of what you write a, a whole lot better. If you write from edge to edge of the paper, top to bottom and side to side, it doesn't look right because it isn't right. There, there, there's no room for a breath. There's no room for white space on the paper. There, there's no room for a pause. There, there's no room to stop and to be still as I talked about at the end Tuesday night of my, uh, my talk Tuesday night. But you are so good at this, and I'm not saying everybody is, but as I'm walking through the camp today on this relatively dry day, I, I, everywhere I go, there are groups of people who have set up chairs around tables, and, and you're sharing uh, good food and friendships and connections and bonds and family. These are the things that if you could dream of anything, this is what you dream of. Jesus says, blessed are those who get to see what you get to see and hear what you get to hear. And he's saying this to his followers who start to find their rhythm in life in what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Americans are horrible at finding that rhythm in terms of dealing with our programming and our schedules and our calendars and trying to keep up, uh, up with everybody else. We, we get so full of, of all the things that we have to do in order to try to keep up with everybody else that's around us that we lose our balance and we lose our way. And so I'm serious about the need for you to teach the rest of the world, which probably has a lot to do with why you're always one of the happiest countries in the world because you know how to do the things that make you truly rich. You know how to stop and, and, and to break bread together and to, to light candles together and to get into cozy situations together and, and to have this huga time, to have this, this time uh, of, of, of a pause in the midst of the chaos of life. I think that's really important, and it's not just important culturally, it's important as followers of Jesus Christ. God created us to take a Sabbath, to take a rest. Even Jesus Christ himself, who's God in the flesh, took time to pause and to wait and, 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 and to go to mountains by himself to pray. But he also did something else. He wasn't just somebody who isolated himself in order to find that rest and that renewal. He was somebody who found that renewal by being in community with his disciples. There are a lot of Christians who say, my Christian faith is, is, is about as good as it can be because it's really just all about Jesus and me. It's, it's all just about this one-way relationship between Jesus Christ and me. But if you want to uh, use an image to remind you of this, just think of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus and you. Absolutely it is. 
but it's also about you and your relationship to the world around you. There's the horizontal beam that goes together with the vertical beam of the cross in order to fill out a more faithful understanding of the Christian faith. That we would not just reduce Christianity to be some sort of private kind of uh, thing that I, that I do or you would do on your own between God and me, but it becomes something that's between God and the community and, and us in the community as a part of the community, this Christian community. The fact of the matter is everywhere we go in scripture, it talks about doing life together, doing uh, spirituality in community. The, uh, the word for this in the ancient Hebrew of the Old Testament in the original text is shalom. Let's just all say that word, say shalom. Shalom is one of those words that when you say it, you almost feel what it means. Shalom means a lot of things that are hard to completely translate in, into other languages. It's just one of those rich words and it, it, it's sort of like a diamond. Depending on the way the light hits it, it, it reflects off with different kinds of looks and colors and feels to it. But it is this word that is necessary for us in our walk through life in this world, in our walk with God. Shalom means peace. Shalom uh, gives us this this time, this this pause, this this sense of not peace that's that's, um, isolated from the chaos, but finding peace in the midst of the chaos. Finding a, a sanctuary in the midst of the storms that have hit us this week. Finding places where, where, where we can find life, even when life isn't perfect, even when things aren't lining up exactly the way we want them to line up. Shalom, shalom. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in one of his most famous books, Life Together, reflected on this shalom and the importance of community. I mean, the title, Life Together, obviously suggests that Christian community was central to Bonhoeffer's theology and his understanding of what the Christian faith is supposed to be. In fact, he argued rather persuasively that if you don't have this community, you really aren't living out the Christian life. That it's hard to do Christianity to the point of impossible if you just wanna make it a private thing between you and God. Bonhoeffer writes in this book, those who love their dream of community will destroy community, but those who love the people around them will create community. How Bonhoeffer-like, right? And I'm sure I'm not saying Bonhoeffer the way you would say Bonhoeffer, but I am an American, so you're just gonna have to uh, give me some grace on that, please. So this is how we say Bonhoeffer in America. We say, and you probably say, Bonhoeffer, is that something to deep like that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So Bonhoeffer said how important it is for us to find this community, but notice he said, if our dream is community is an end to itself, we're gonna destroy it. What a subtle and important point that he makes there for us. What a great warning that we don't wanna make an idol out of any aspect of our Christian faith, but underneath it all, there's something deeper. There's always something deeper than just our pursuits for what we want to get. If you remember the ladder that was up here on Tuesday night. And that deeper thing is, and that deeper one, that deeper uh, Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. And, And that, the one who is deeper, comes alongside of us and he calls us to something more. And what he calls us to, now he doesn't just call us to it, let's, let's say it for what it is. He commands us to this. This is not a polite suggestion. This is not like a, here's a tip for a better life from Jesus. No, this is out of Jesus Christ's love for you and you having a full life, Jesus says, you must, I command you to love one another. We have a holy day during Holy Week called Holy Thursday or in America we often call it Maundy Thursday and Maundy is a Latin word that's taken from the root word that means mandate. The commandment Thursday. It's not just the Thursday that we remember Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. It's the Thursday that we remember that Jesus Christ mandated to his disciples that they love one another the way he has loved them. A grace-based love. A love that puts other people ahead of themselves. A, A reminder. You cannot continue to follow me if you don't do it together. 
We need each other. And that's particularly difficult these days and in a country where so few people want to embrace or call themselves active followers of Jesus Christ. And it's not just in Denmark. This is becoming a growing issue in the United States too where, where, where I lead a church. And so this is a problem that we have to look at, but we can't give up community along the way. As convenient as it is for us to do so many things on our smartphones and our, our, our digital communication tools, laptops, whatever it might be, I would encourage you to resist the temptation to minimize your faith and make it all about that. Turn off the screens on a regular basis. Don't lose your huga. <laughs> Hold on, keep lighting the candles, Denmark. Keep gathering together in the campgrounds. Keep coming to, to, to Bible camps. Keep, keep doing what you do. Show up for church. You, you, you go home to, here, here's, the, here's always the challenge of this, and this is true in America too. People go from churches that maybe aren't uh, everything that they had hoped or, or would dream that they would be, uh, the dream of a perfect community, and they come to a week like this at Yalarup and, and, and they, they, they hit a kind of a mountaintop. They say, this is great, we're hanging out with uh, all these other Christians, and, and we've, we found our tribe, we found our people, we, we, we found people who speak the language we speak, and have the the vision that we have and the dreams that we have and, and have the understanding and the worldview that we have about who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we have to go home. Now, now we have to go home and, and, and go back and, and then it's just gonna be a few of us instead of a lot of us. And so how can we keep this going? How, how do we keep the momentum going? Well, I guess it depends. And I'm not saying this is easy, but I would start by encouraging you not to be consumers of the Christian faith, but to be servants of Jesus Christ. And if you see things in your church that could be better, then do something about it. You are the church. That's what the scriptures say. You and I together collectively are the church. So where you go, the church goes. Church isn't just a building where you show up on Sunday morning to worship the Lord. That's an essential part of the Christian journey and the faith, but church is also what you do during the week, and the, the connections that you have, and the conversations that you have, and the relationships that you form, and, and, and the, the things that you do, the things that you say, the decisions that you make about what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it, whether it's God's way or the world's way. Community is so important for that. We, we cannot reach our potential as Christians by ourselves. So please do this again and turn to the person next to you and very seriously I want you to say, you need me baby. Just go ahead and say, you, you absolutely need me. You can't do this without me. It's true. And this is not, <laughs> you're really good at that turn to the neighbor thing, I gotta say. I lose you for about 20 seconds, all right? So come on back. That's good, it's just because you're, it's Bible camp. You're chilling, right? You're relaxed, you're, you got a lot of hygge this week. It's, uh, it's all good, baby. So, so here we are longing for and dreaming for this perfect community and I would suggest to you you're in it. This is it. This is the time, it, yes, this is a bit of a mountaintop week compared to the other 51 weeks of the year. For me too, I wanna make sure you hear that, and for my wife. We have so enjoyed getting to know some of you and the conversations we've had and the connections that we've made and, 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 and <laughs> there's about 17 people now who wanna come and intern at our church. That's great, that's awesome. I don't think we can take all of you, but you know, we'll, we'll try to figure it out. We do want to build that bridge between the church in the United States and the church in Denmark. We want to be a part of that, and it's been such a blessing to us. I want to make sure you hear that. We are learning more from you than you're learning from us. So we have this challenge before us. How can we go on following Jesus Christ if when we go home we, we don't have these thriving communities in, in, in our churches? I'm gonna say more about that as we go because I'm very hopeful about those churches that you're going home to. I still believe they're the hope of the world and the hope of Denmark. 
I still believe it's the best thing God has going in this land. And that is not to say any, of, any church is perfect, yours, mine, anybody's. But it is to say it is the hope of the world. In the New Testament, Jesus connects back to an Old Testament story about the Passover meal that was established in the book of Exodus. And he's instituting a new sacrament, which you shared here on Sunday. And you'll do again when you go home to your churches. And Jesus says, I've been very eager to share and to eat this Passover meal with each of you. The pictures that you see on that screen, which, are they still there? Yeah, okay, because they're not there for me. Now they're back. Um, this is really a weird way to preach, I gotta tell you, but I'm, I'm digging it. It's a fun challenge, because the screen's there and then it just disappears. And so I don't even know anymore. Uh, so here on the screen, over on the left, uh, that's my grandmother, uh, Householder, my uh, paternal grandmother, and her parents were from uh, Stavanger, Norway. Uh, not too far from here. In fact, most of my relatives on her side of the family are from that area and that region. Please do not hold that against me. I know it's not as good as Denmark, but it's close, right? It's nearby. When, uh, when I was seven years old, I, my family and I went to Seattle, Washington to visit my grandma and my grandpa, and uh, she was ill. She uh, she ended up dying in her mid-60s of uh, cancer, and it was uh, my first introduction as a young boy to what cancer is and, and how rough it can be. But even though my grandma was very sick that summer when I went to visit her, she uh, made a special effort, the way a good Scandinavian gr grandmother would, to uh, prepare a meal. And she prepared this big feast for uh, our family and my cousins and my aunts and uncles and everybody who'd come to their house. The last time we'd all be together before she died uh, as a family, the last time we'd have some huga time, even though we didn't know what to call it then. And she knew the importance of uh, this meal. In the same way Jesus knew the importance of the meal that he was about to share with, with his disciples the night before he was crucified, the night of his betrayal. My grandma knew she was going to die. She knew it probably wouldn't be long. And I'm sure in her heart there was something that said, I've been very eager to share this meal with you, this supper. I've been very eager for you all to come. I know you've been coming for a long time. And she prepared this big feast. And I don't remember what she prepared for everybody else, but I was kind of a picky eater when I was a little kid. That is not a problem for me anymore. I'll eat anything. But back then, I was just really, really, really picky. And there were only a few things that I really, really enjoyed eating when I was seven years old. But she's my grandma, and she loved me, so she knew my list. And she prepared one meal for everybody else, and she prepared ham and potato chips for me. I know it's a weird combo, but my grandma got it. And when she put that plate before me, seeing what everybody else had to eat and how I didn't want anything to do with any of that stuff, and, and she put this, my two favorite foods at the time right in front of me, I felt loved. I felt the power of my grandmother's love in that moment that she, even though I knew she was very sick, I didn't fully understand, but I knew she was very sick, that she prepared this big meal for the whole family, that she had gone out of her way, gone the extra mile to prepare a specific meal for her picky grandson because she loved me like that. Huh. If you could dream anything, oh, how I dreamed to be able to go back and just have one more meal with loved ones in my family who have died, who've passed away. The people that I broke bread with, the people who were so close and important to me, friends too, not just family, people I've done life together with, people I'm in communion with, people I, I walk together with in community, church people that I've buried because I'm their pastor, and I walk alongside of them for years and years and decades, and then something happens and they die, and, and I'm the one who presides at their funeral, and oh, how I'd long to have another good old Lutheran potluck in the basement with some of them. 
There's just something about those meals, something about those community times, something about the breaking of the bread. Go back to that opening video. If you could dream anything for 75 years, that's what you'd dream because those are the richest people. Those are the people who have the wealth. Those are the people who are most alive. (laughs) When the buildings in New York City were going down on September 11, 2001, and when people were in these airplanes and they knew they'd been hijacked, a lot of phone calls were made from those airplanes. Nobody called loved ones to, to say, you know, I really don't like you. I'm really sick of you. They, they called because they wanted to have one more moment. Nobody called and said, hey, uh, make sure you deposit that check in the bank account. Hey, make sure you take the garbage out. Hey, make sure you, know, you, 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 you get that promotion at work. Because when it's all said and done, that doesn't matter. Relative to these relationships that enrich our lives, our relationship with God, the vertical beam of the cross and our relationship with community, with people in the world around us. What a blessing that is. What an opportunity that is to live a full and an abundant life. Other pictures there, just pictures of family and get-togethers. And I gotta tell you, it's rare now. It's rare that I miss it. You know, my wife and I are getting a little older. Our nest is empty. We have three adult children now. They're all out on their own. Two of them are married. The other one's on his way to doing the same. The very, very rare times when we can get our schedules lined up and get that whole family together, oh, we cherish those moments. We cherish those moments. If we could dream anything, that's what we dream. Don't miss it. Don't undervalue this. Don't undervalue Christian fellowship and family and friends and and community and the people you get to do life together with. And if you're hearing me talk about this and you say, but this isn't me, I'm all alone, I'm all by myself, I don't have anybody. Welcome home, welcome to the church, welcome to a place where you will be loved and you will be included. You say, well actually I had an experience in a church that wasn't like that, it was very standoffish, they didn't welcome me. So I've had it with church, really? Would you stop brushing your teeth if you didn't like the first toothpaste you ever tried? I mean, if it didn't work out, would you just give up on the whole (laughs) toothbrushing thing? That's not a problem in Denmark, is it? I don't know. You do brush your teeth, right? Okay. Don't give up on community just because you had a bad experience once. Don't give up on fellowship. Don't give up on connecting to sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ. There's a family out there for you. Do you know that? Do you have those connections? In addition to if you're blessed with biological families and and relatives and loved ones, double bonus. But the Bible says this church that we are is family, that we're called to do this together. And underneath it, there's this deeper truth that all of us have been wired up by God to want to know and we want to be known. We want to understand but we also want to be understood. We want to learn to love, but we also want to be loved. It goes both ways. We want to know, 1 Corinthians 13, which talks about the greatest things that we could live for, the greatest gifts, faith, hope, and love, right before it gets to that ending that everybody knows, it says, now we see in a a mirror that's dimly lit. Like we're looking into this life through a fog, but then, then we will see God face to face. Then we, now we know only in part, but then we will fully know. To know and to be known. We see examples of this in the Bible. God said right from the beginning, it's not good that, that Adam should be alone, that the man should be alone. I'll, I'll make him a helper as his partner. We see examples of friendship in the Old Testament. David and Jonathan, we see examples of accountability. Moses and Jethro, we see examples of strength. A triple braided cord is not easily broken in Ecclesiastes 4. We see examples of encouragement. Uh, Barnabas in the church in the New Testament. Barnabas, was, his name means the encourager. We're better together. The photo that you see there is of a boat racing team. That's me in the front in the blue shirt. No, that's not. That's a lie. Uh, That's somebody much smaller than me. Uh, But they are uh, rowing. And the thing about rowing a boat, and any of you who've ever been on a crew or a rowing team like this would know this, that it's not just about power and strength. It's about unity. 
It's about learning to put your oar in the water at the exact same moment that the person in front of you and the person behind you puts their oar in the water. And it's about moving through the water in the exact same pace and coming out of the water at the exact same time and doing it over and over and over again. Which is why the guy in the blue shirt is there barking out signals to keep everybody in unison, to keep everybody rowing in the same direction at the same time. You could have... The most value, this is true about almost any sport, isn't it? It certainly is in the sports that I follow, and I'm, I'm sure it is in, in football, and I know that football means that game where you kick the ball around into nets, right? I'm learning that. And some of you are like, what else would it be? It, it doesn't matter. Um, but you're right, I have no idea why we call American football football. The kicker is like the least important person on the whole team, but never mind that. So... If you follow, uh, if you have a favorite football team, and you have a team of, of several superstars on that team, but you don't have players that play together as a team, how successful will that team be when it meets a team that has superstars that play together, that are willing to sacrifice things in order to put their oars in the water at the same time and move at the same time and come out? It's not about individual glory, it's about team goals. It's about community before the individual. Same thing is true in, in sports, it's true in life. We put our oars in the water together as Christians, which means we have to listen to each other, which means we have to love each other, which means we have to learn how to do that together at the same time in unison with one another for the sake of the mission of the church, among other things. There's another story in the Old Testament about Daniel and his four friends. He had a community with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three most fun names to say in the whole Bible. I, is, I don't know how you say it in Danish. Will you just tell me? Is it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also in Danish? Is it? Say yes or no. Yes. Let's say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are three guys who are tight, and Daniel is too. And they show up in King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, and they become, well, Daniel at least becomes the dreamer. He's got this literal dream job. These four young men God sent into this place. We don't have time to go through the details of all the different kingdoms and what go is going on here, but the first dream that Daniel interpreted, he interpreted to say to the king, here's what's going to happen. Here's the future kingdoms that are going to come in and take over your Babylonian kingdom, but then there's going to be a final kingdom that you should keep your eye on, and that kingdom will never be conquered, and it will never be destroyed, and that kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. That kingdom is the rock. And that's what your dream means, Daniel said to the king. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down before, um, before false idols or gods, a big 90-foot statue that's built before them. Uh, sorry, I used American measurements. 90 feet in metric is, I don't know, do the conversion yourself. But it's, it's really big. And so everybody's bowing down at certain times before this idol that's been built by the king, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are men of God. And even if the whole rest of the culture around them is going the world's way, they're going to stay faithful and true, and it's going to bless them. And so they say, I'm sorry, respectfully, we're just not going to do that. And so then they get thrown into this fiery furnace. <laughs> I think the king had some anger issues, but we don't have time to get into that either. And then, much to his surprise, the king looks inside of the fiery furnace, and he says, look, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. And a lot of biblical scholars believe that that's Jesus Christ showing up, or the presence of God, or God's spirit showing up to save their lives and to keep them from being harmed in the fiery furnace. They're not harmed, and the king is so impressed that he starts to change his kingdom. Don't underestimate the power of a community to change the world around you. It doesn't have to be big. In Germany, the wall came down. In Berlin, because a Lutheran pastor started a movement. Did you know that? In his little church, his local church. And that little movement turned into a huge, massive protest that led to enough pressure for that wall to come down. Do not underestimate the power of what you and your tribe, your church can do. What God can do through you. 
Daniel's story in community with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reminds us of this. As we turn to the New Testament, we're reminded of who we are. As it is, there are many parts, but there is one body. 1 Corinthians 12. You are Christ's body. You are the body of Christ. So that, as I said before, wherever you go, that's where the church is. You must never forget this, the Bible says. You must never forget your call and your command to share God's love with the world around us. Because if the church doesn't do this, who will? If you, the Christian church in Denmark, don't live and lead with the love of Jesus Christ, who's going to do that? Who's going to bring that love, undeserved and free, grace-based to the world around you, here in this beautiful land, Who's going to do what you have been commanded to do? Love, this is the thing. The decisive word, Bonhoeffer says, without God's love, everything disintegrates and is unacceptable. In God's love, everything is integrated and united. God is love. Thus, what love is can be known only by one who knows God. And yet, 1 Corinthians 11 reminds us that when we meet together sometimes as Christians, it brings out our worst side instead of our best. I'm sure we've all had experiences like this in church life. You can hear this and say, this is a little too idealistic about what church is. No, I'm very realistic about what church is. The problem with the church is human beings are involved. (laughs) And we are flawed and sinful and fallen, and so we're going to mess things up. When I was called to start Lutheran Church of Hope 25 years ago, the church that I'm still a pastor of, I was was told by my bishop I had to go door to door with brochures inviting people to this church that didn't exist yet. That was intimidating. I'm Scandinavian. I don't want to do anything like that. Knocking on doors of strangers and then talking about religion. Oh, everybody wants to talk about religion all the time, right? Not at all. But I did, and I knocked on those doors, and I invited people, and I got some people really upset with me. Uh, one, one person said, the church is just a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, you, 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 there's nothing genuine about the church. There's nothing genuine about Christianity. I'm not unrealistic about the criticism of the church. I hear it all the time. I get it, and I understand it. My hope in the church isn't because the church is going to become a perfect community all by ourselves. My hope in the church and what God can do through us is in the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit to hit our sails and move us forward, to move us toward what we are called to become. My hope is in Jesus Christ and in him alone, but it is his church And so rumors of the demise of the Christian church have been greatly exaggerated because Jesus Christ and his kingdom cannot be destroyed. It will last forever. So even when you feel like an an overwhelming minority in the country where you reside, you're on the winning team. You're on the team that in the end is a part of a kingdom that will stand. While everything else around it will crumble and fall, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You're holding on to hope in all of the right places, in all of the right places. I get this report about your divisiveness, though, the Apostle Paul writes, competing with and criticizing each other. Let's stop just for a moment before we move to the very much more hopeful ending. What kind of a church am I? And what kind of a church are you? And I use that properly. I don't mean what kind of a church is that church that you go to. Remember, you're the church. So what kind of a church are you? What kind of a church am I? Are you secure or insecure? Do you encourage others or do you sabotage their efforts? Do you, do you um, uh, praise others' strengths, which is what secure church people do and Christians do, or do you criticize others' faults? which is always so easy. There was a man who came to our church about 10 years ago, and he was a new member, and at the new member class, he came up to me and said, I just want you to know I have the spiritual gift of criticism, so I'm going to help you with that. (laughs) I said, gosh, I didn't know criticism was a spiritual gift. I'm going to have to reread the whole Bible. It's not a spiritual gift. It's not helpful to the body of Christ. But it's so easy to do, which is why so many people do it. 
Criticism's easy. Being cynical is easy. Now, and it usually is coming out of our own insecurities. What's hard, but what is healthy, not just for those that we praise when they deserve it, make it authentic, I don't mean false praise, but what is hard is praising people who deserve it consistently over and over, even if you're not going to get any praise. Even if you're going to give it all away, but it's so good for the body of Christ. It's so good. The rest of the list that you can read through, the secure church gives away credit. The insecure church demands credit for everything they do. I have to be honored. I have to be recognized. I have to be noticed. I I have to have somebody say that I did a good job or or I'm never going to do it again. Well, at a certain point, that's on us if that's our approach. The secure church is quick to build teams. The insecure church prefers to do things alone. Which one are you? As you live out your Christian life, do you seek to do that in community? Even when that community isn't perfect? (laughs) I've had people at our church back home in America say to me, well, I'm just not so sure the whole Christian fellowship thing is for me, the, the, the small group Bible study format. I, I, I mean, I, I went to a small group Bible study uh, last week, and some of those people in that group, <laughs> and, and I, I said to him, I said, well, um, is it just them or is it you too, maybe? I mean, may, maybe it's you. If, um, if you're in a small group, somebody's going to be a little bit crazy, If you're in a family, somebody's going to be crazy, right? There's always somebody uh, along the way who's a little bit off. And if you're going, there's nobody like that in my family, it's you then. You're the one, right? (laughs) Just kidding. So when it comes to you in the church, are you just a fan in the stands or are you in the game? Do you see yourself as a part of the team? The problem with the church and the world today is there are, let's say, I don't know, it looks like a World Cup soccer match, right? 60,000 people in the stands in desperate need of exercise and 22 soccer players in desperate need of rest. <laughs> we need to kind of redistribute those numbers. We, 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 we need to get out of the game. Here, here's the really good news. You're called into the game. You are the church. Not just your pastor or your, or your board or, or your church leaders or your Sunday school teachers or, 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 or the choir directors. You, whoever you are, you're the church. So what part of the team are you? And and how are you living that out? And how are you playing this game for the glory of God? Not for the glory of you, but for the glory of God. And for the sake of the mission of the church. For the sake of reaching Denmark with the gospel. I mean, for the sake of reaching Denmark with the gospel. I hope when you hear that, something inside your soul just stirs and you start to realize, oh, we're not just doing church to see what we can get out of it. We're doing church together to see what God can do through us. Maybe it's time to go home and ask God, what do you want to do through me? God, I would love to see what you can do through me as a part of this community, as a part of this church, which is going to not be a perfect church. Those don't exist. But what can you do through me, God, to make it better? What can you do through me to widen your kingdom here in Denmark? What can you do through me to lead more people to faith in Jesus Christ? What can you do through us together as a church? It's not just you. It's all of us together. We are the church. We're the church. In our church back home, there are uh, over 20,000 members, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Uh, God has grown that church. I take zero credit for it. I saw how far the church could go when when I was doing it for God. And then I had a real humbling experience and I surrendered the church to God. And this was just a few months after I got there, 25 years ago. And I said, God, I just want to see what you want to do with this church. And that changed everything. It changed, it put us on a whole new trajectory and then God started sending people to us. Left to right on the screen, there's Jeremy Zmolik, who, uh, I'm not making this up, he was in a boy band. I mean, he had all the moves, right? He was an American uh, music band, and you know, they'd go out and all the kids would scream, and he was kind of a big deal, and then he kind of got lost and wandered away from God and, and lost his faith and lost his direction. 
lost his family, and woke up one day as a young man in his 30s and said, there's got to be something more. And somebody invited him to Hope, our church, and Jesus Christ got a hold of him. We did not get a hold of him. It isn't our church. It's the God of our church who gets a hold of us. And you have the same God at your church. The same God who has the power to transform lives and wants to do that through you and your church. Next from left to right is Melissa Dale, who was a um, full-blown drug addict. She was imprisoned in Des Moines. Made a deal with God in prison. You know, one of those prayers, God, if, if you get me out of here, I'll never do drugs again. I'll worship you. I'll follow you. She wasn't kidding around. She's serious. She joined recovery groups, and now she leads our recovery groups. She doesn't just lead our recovery groups at our church. She leads recovery groups for the whole state of Iowa. She's been interviewed by Oprah Winfrey, for crying out loud. This is, this is what God does with people who surrender their lives to him. <laughs> Not that getting interviewed by Oprah is like the be-all, end-all, but it's pretty cool. And that's Khalil Carter, who was a professional American football player, you know, with the shoulder pads and the helmets and all that stuff. And he was really good. And he knew it, and he was pretty full of himself, too. And he uh, left God behind because what else would he need? He's a professional football player. He's reached the top until he wasn't on a football team anymore because he got caught, and he started to realize, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And did I abandon what was really the better dream, the stuff that really made me rich, which wasn't my fame and popularity as a professional athlete. It was... The relationship I used to have with Jesus Christ. And he returned to that and reclaimed it. And now he's leading a sports ministry in our church where thousands of kids are, are starting to line up to come to learn about Jesus Christ. And he's using sports as the means to teach them about a Savior who will be with them forever and ever. Do not underestimate what God can do through you and through your church together in community. This is uh, Haisham El Garouj. He has run four laps around a 400 meter track faster than any human being in the history of the world. Nobody has ever ran four laps around an Olympic track faster than him. He did it in three minutes and 43 seconds, 0.13. That's super fast if you know anything about track and field. 1,600 meters in three minutes and 43 seconds, ridiculous. Absolutely. If you don't think so, go to a local track and try it and see how close you get to three minutes and 43 seconds on your own. This is our local high school team, uh, Gym Nation here in Denmark, I'm learning. Uh, high school students in America uh, try out for sports teams in, in their high school, including a track team. This is the local track team, and I know this team very well because I'm their uh, volunteer announcer for the track meets. I get on the microphone and I announce the different events and who's running them and the different teams and who's winning and all those kinds of things. It's just one of the ways I try to volunteer in the community. These four young men, just this last spring, were really good for a high school track team, uh, 16, 17-year-old boys. They, um, they won the state track meet, which is kind of a big deal, right? Now, I want to ask you a question. On the bottom of the screen is the man who's run four laps around a track faster than any man in the history of the world, or woman. On the top of the screen are four 16 and 17-year-olds from my local community, my neighbors. Three of them go to our church. Who do you think ran faster? The fastest man in the world or a team of 16 and 17-year-olds from any school in America? fast, but not world record holders by any means. There's the world record time for an individual. There's the time that those four 16 and 17 year olds ran the same distance. 16 and 17 year olds are 25 seconds faster than the fastest man in the world when they learn how to do life together. When they learn how to run the race together as a team. You think you can do it by yourself this life? You're just wrong. 
You need the people around you. I wasn't just kidding before when I had you turn to those people and say, you need me, baby. You do. If you want to reach your full potential, if you want your faith to grow, if you want this dream of a perfect community and a wholehearted faith and a peace and all these other things we've been talking about all week, you're going to have to find community. You're going to have to find people to run the race with. There's, by the way, the world record for four men running together. It's... uh, 48 seconds, 40, 49 seconds faster than an individual. We are better together than we are as individuals, and that's why God ordered his church this way. You're Christ's body. That's who you are, the Bible says. It's who you are, and it's who I am. And what we can do together is infinitely better than what we can do apart. Our church has dug over 300 clean water wells in Ghana, and we've started over 300 churches in Ghana, And now in those churches in Ghana, Africa, over 80,000 people show up for worship every Sunday. There are more people worshiping at churches that we started in Africa than in Iowa where we started. That's not us. That's not me saying, look what we do, do what we do. That's not it at all. That is me giving glory to God in heaven and saying, look what God can do through anyone through anyone. Look what God can do through a church that starts to learn what it means to do life together. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Together is the church in Denmark. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, the scriptures declare, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to a path of peace. That's a picture from our Christmas service last year. One of three in that arena downtown Des Moines. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. I was uh, having a meal with some of the uh, leaders who were leading the young kids, and they were asking about our church, and they wanted to know how big it was, and I told them, and, and they said, oh, wow, I don't think we have any churches like that in Denmark, and then another one of the friends would say, we don't. Yeah, that, that's not, the, but it's not, bigger is not better. Please don't hear me say that. Smaller is not better. Better is better. More faithful is better. Learning what it means to be the church wherever it is that you are. For whatever reason, God decided to grow a big church where we are and maybe a small church somewhere else. I'm for all of it. That's great. I'm for the church. I'm for the church as the hope of the world. But I want to close my time with you here in Denmark by leaving you with just a thought. I just want to plant this seed in your hearts and minds and souls. Without a doubt in my mind, from the moment we flew in, and I told you about that on Tuesday night, and the, and the vision that we could physically see out the airplane window of this Bible camp where nothing else is happening like this in, in the world, where people come together for a whole week in, in, in this kind of volume, and this kind of numbers. I want to tell you from, from then forward, to seeing the way you do life together, you do community together, your, your hearts, your kindness, your zeal, your passion, your, 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 you're the body of Christ. You're the church. You're the hope of the world, particularly in Denmark. Because the fact of the matter is, if 98 to 90% of Denmark has run away from Jesus Christ, You need to start thinking like missionaries, because you are. That's exactly what you are here in Denmark. You are missionaries right here in this country. Start thinking like that. Start seeing it that way. God, what can you do through us? Start asking those questions. Start humbling yourselves with one another. Start building teams together. Start building networks with other churches. Start finding ways to say, not what's in this for us, but what's in this for the kingdom of God? What's in this for the future of of Denmark? What can God do through us to make an impact, to make a difference? That's the perfect community that we dream of. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins, and so this is not about pretending that we're perfect. Not trying to give you a pep talk to go out there and go trying to tell you a truth from God's word about your identity. 
Because there's no way we're going to carry out our mission unless we figure out who we are first. You are the body of Christ. You're the church, which means you're the hope of the world. And wherever you go, hope goes with you. Be a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ in your daily lives. Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to let your light shine. Sometimes in grand and glorious ways, sometimes in very subtle ways. You never know what God's going to do with that. How God transforms lives by leaning people into community. By helping them find the rich life that their spirits and hearts long for. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. There's that word perfect. Love perfects a lot of imperfections. (laughs) Love is why my grandma, instead of saying, what's with my grandson and his picky eating? What kind of a kid is he? And scolding me and shaming me and making me feel awful about it. Instead, she just had grace for me, and she had love for me. (laughs) And it just strikes me standing here, and because of that, I'm telling you about her. Love is more powerful than we think sometimes. It hits us deeper than we think sometimes. That's what makes us perfect. I want to close by showing you this clip from a movie called Friday Night Lights, which was a big hit. It's about American football, but go ahead and pretend it's soccer. It'll help. Or team handball. Or um, This is a high school football team, and it's based on a true story. Uh, high school football is a big deal in America, American football. Uh, it's a particularly big deal in the state of Texas, where this city is from and this high school's from. And Billy Ray Thornton portrays the real-life coach who at halftime of the state championship game. I mean, I know it's a, it's a halftime talk. It's halfway through the game. But what it really is is a word from the Lord. Because he cares more about the hearts of his team and those kids than he does about winning the state championship. And so he points them to this thing called perfect. All season long, he's been telling them, you have to be perfect. You have to be perfect. You have to be perfect. And all along, his players thought he meant, you have to be a perfect athlete. You have to run perfect plays. You have to, you have to be perfect out there on the field. It's not what he meant at all. And he picked a really important time to tell them halftime of the most important game of their lives and he gives them this important life lesson about the power of love and what perfection really is as we dream about a perfect community consider this community this american football team but as you watch it i don't want you to think about american football i want you to think about you and the community that god has put around you and i want you to hear this as God's call for you. It's real simple.
for one another. That this is love. And love perfects a lot of imperfect things. Love makes right a lot of wrong things. And we get the inspiration for that love from a God who loves us like that. Who has given us what we don't deserve. New life, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, faith, hope, love, purpose, meaning, direction, riches. And I'm not talking about piles of money. I'm talking about the rich, the wealth that comes from being in relationships of love with people in the world around you. The athletes close with the Lord's Prayer. And I think that's a good way to close (laughs) our time together here, which I know my wife and I will look back on as perfect. Not perfect weather. (laughs) Not uh, perfect preachers. Not perfect in any way that's about us. Perfect in love. Perfect in Christian community. Don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate what God can do through you together. Find each other out there. Keep coming together for these camps every year. And then go out and build the church. Mm. More accurately, let God build his church through you. Let his power be made perfect through your weakness, as the scriptures declare. You do not have to be a perfect church. You do not have to be a perfect Christian. You just need to be willing to go. And you just need to do it in community. You just need to find each other and carry out this calling that God has for you. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer, but I want to do this in a way um, that's going to be slightly uncomfortable to some of you, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I think this is important. I want you to hold the hands of the people next to you. You don't have to go across the aisle. Just let's not go crazy, right? Just in the section you're in. And I want you to feel that bond that God creates in us. Nothing weird about it. You're the body of Christ. And individually members of it and learning to coordinate your actions and learning to be um, an efficient body, an effective body, a faithful body. A well-exercised body with worship and Bible study and prayer. Uh, a, a body that runs for the glory of God. That's who you are. Our identity leads to our mission. Together, let's pray. Our, you know what would be cool? You pray it in Danish. Some of us will pray it in English, a very few of us. And you lead the prayer. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer in Danish. Go. Thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, church, and give you his shalom, his peace, for you to be who you are and to carry out the calling that you have been given together. Amen.